Hi, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Thursday's Dyer Literary Series. And tonight, our feature is Morgan Baker. And um, we will uh, set you up here. Uh, Morgan at Morgan lived in Hawaii for a year, returned to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she teaches at Emerson College. Um, she has had work published in the Boston Globe, Boston Globe Magazine, the Brevity Nonfiction Blog, New York Times Magazine, The Bark, The Bucket, where she is the managing editor, uh, Martha's Vineyards Times, Expression Managing, Talking Writing, uh, and many, many more. Um, she has a brand new book that's coming out on May the 2nd, but if you contact her, she can send you a copy before that. So uh, I'm sure she would love to talk to you about her new book and read from it, and we would love to talk to her. So welcome, Morgan. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here, and I want to thank Lisa for introducing me to you, Tim, and thank you for inviting me to be here. So this is my new book. It's actually my first, my debut memoir, um, Emptying the Nest, Getting Better at Goodbyes. And the title um, should probably give you a big hint on what the topic is. So I'm gonna read three very short um, sections and I'm gonna start with the very beginning and then jump to two other sections that um, are dog oriented. I suck at goodbyes, separations, and transitions. Sometimes I sneak to bed to avoid saying goodnight to my family. When our oldest daughter, Maggie, headed off to college, a big transition, I expected to struggle. And struggle I did. Maggie and I stood by Matt's blue station wagon in the parking lot in front of her new college dorm. The trunk and roof rack were empty. We had finished unloading boxes and bags of clothes and bedding for Maggie's freshman year. Maggie, Matt, Ellie, and I sweated in the August sun. An accomplished field hockey goalie, Maggie arrived at the empty campus two weeks before the crush of students and parents. I hugged her, trying to be brave. I love you. Maggie pushed me away into Matt. Take her, she said. I can hear the warble in her voice. Her long dark ponytail swayed as Maggie walked away to stand alone on the steps, dressed in jean shorts and a tank top for the steamy August day. I had practiced saying goodbye with our litter of puppies early in the year, but seeing nine puppies move on to forever homes was very different than saying goodbye to Maggie. I'd prefer to say I didn't get depressed after she stood on the top of her dorm stairs, looked over her shoulder and waved goodbye, that then I took some meds, did some therapy, and presto, everything was great. I wish that had been the case, but that isn't what happened. And then this is a section about uh, finding out about um, our, our dog was pregnant, and now I'm going to find out how many puppies she's having. Spray's mom called the vet tech from across the waiting room at Slade. She waved at me to follow her into the room where spray had been inseminated in November. In January, she was being x-rayed to verify how many pups she was carrying. Spray's x-ray was displayed on a large screen. I didn't know what I was looking at. Each puppy, she, um, each puppy Dr. Friendly explained, grows in an individual sack. I nodded. For female dogs, the uterus has two long arms called horns, where the puppies grow like links on a chain. During birth, they take turns sliding down the horns and depositing themselves in the uterus before coming through the birth canal and out into the world. After Dr. Friendly showed me one puppy sack, she pointed to each sack and counted. She got to five and kept counting. She counted to seven, and I nodded my head uh, having assumed Spray would have more than the five on the original ultrasound. But Dr. Friendly didn't stop at seven, the number I had banked on. Eight, she pointed. I looked from Dr. Friendly to the vet tech. Nine, she pointed. Ten, she pointed. My mouth dropped open in a way that only happens in cartoons. There might be an 11th in there, she added, but we can't tell. She indicated an ambiguous shape high up on the screen. I covered my mouth with my hand and stood still. I had nothing to say. Spray had 10 puppies chock-a-block inside her. 
That might explain her exceptionally hard stomach and why she didn't circle dance anymore. Oh, I managed. Yes, Dr. Friendly said, 10. The vet tech told me to get spray and follow her out to the reception area. There I stood in a daze as she inundated me with information on the care spray would need until she gave birth. I nodded my head a lot as though I was following what she was saying. I shouldn't overfeed her, 10. She would want only small meals spaced out during the day. 10, I should give her a lot of water. 10, both the vet and the tech recommended that Spray have a C-section for safety reasons because her litter was so large. Multiple hands would be available to pull the puppies out at the same time and they could make sure each was healthy. It would also keep Spray from going into inertia and stalling out during the birthing process, which had happened to her mother. Puppies die that way. In the meantime, Spray also needed more blood work to help narrow down the time of her delivery. The idea of a C-sec, uh, I stood there nodding. What I wondered, but didn't say, 10 fucking puppies. The idea of a C-section scared me, but the idea of 10 puppies and or a dead spray dog terrified me even more. I nodded my head once more, prayed I had retained some of what they were telling me, and stumbled out of the office with Spray. I stood in the parking lot, and before I even put Spray in the car, I texted Matt, Maggie, and Ellie one word, 10. I was going to be a nursemaid to 10 puppies. We were going to have to clean up after 10 puppies, and we were going to have to find homes for 10 puppies. 10? Really? 10? This is a, a birth scene. Morgan, Matt's scream from the first floor reached the third floor and woke me up. It's happening. I think it's dead. No, I leapt from my bed, ran past the girls' bedrooms and charged downstairs. I arrived in the back room, the coldest room in our house at the end of January and found Matt holding a puppy in one hand while Spray lay on the gray carpet at his feet. I think it's dead, Matt said again. He did not look overjoyed with the birth of this puppy. He stared at me as though I had an answer. I didn't. I was gonna kill Matt for coming up with this crazy idea. And now we had a dead puppy. This wasn't happening. My nightmare was coming to life. Upstairs, Ellie had run into Maggie's room screaming, Maggie, Maggie, all the puppies are dead. Maggie jolted awake, worried she had slept through her chemistry exam. Once she realized it was still hours away, she shifted her worry to the puppies. The girls ran downstairs in their pajamas. Ellie stopped on the second floor. She had no interest in seeing dead puppies. She would wait it out. Maggie joined us. It was 3.30 in the morning and we looked at each other, not sure what to do. We weren't supposed to be alone. We had made our plans carefully to either be with Laura or a vet. Our plans were toast. Call someone, Matt barked. When he had checked on spray at 1 a.m., all was fine, he told me. But when he woke up again, Spray was licking something on his stomach, a puppy sack. Matt didn't know how long the puppy had been lying on top of him. He tore open the sack and then yelled for me. I called Laura and the vet tech from Slade. Laura had been right. Spray wasn't waiting. Laura told us to get a bulb syringe to suction the mucus out of the puppy's mouth. But I hadn't had one of those in the house since the kids were little. Almost immediately, she told us later, she turned to her partner and said, that puppy is going to die. The vet tech answered her phone and promptly hung up. I wasn't wearing any glasses and I can't hear or see without them. I was confused, she said. How's Spray? Spray's fine, I said. Spray sighed. She was unfazed by all the activity around her. I told the tech about the puppy. Morgan, tell Matt to hold the puppy in the palm of his hand, cover it with a towel, and gently swing the puppy towards him from his shoulder down to his knees to clear its lungs. Before I could repeat the message, Matt was doing it. How do you know to do that, I asked. All that reading material you gave me, he answered and smiled. The puppy opened its mouth and peeped. Looks like the bitch is gonna do it herself, the tech said and hung up. The puppy breathed, I breathed, the puppy lived, and I let Matt live. Thank you, Morgan. What a uh, amazing uh, sections that you read. And uh, I mean, uh, congratulations on your book. It's, the book is called Emptying the Nest. 
getting better at goodbyes. So one thing that I saw when I checked your book out, it was a lot of it had to do with the empty nest. Your daughter Maggie left, and then all the all the puppies went away, and uh, you know, and you fell into a depression. Was that something that you anticipated or like thought about in advance, or did it just happen? Um, well, I have a history of depression, so I sort of knew that I was going to um, probably have a little bit of an issue with Maggie leaving. I didn't think I was going to have an issue with the puppies leaving. That was a big surprise. Um, but um, and I didn't think that I was going to um, fall as deep and as hard as I did um, when Maggie left that and it didn't happen immediately it took a while but it was gradual and then it was a big um tumble into darkness did you reach out to Maggie at that time or yeah so Maggie um um so there were in the book I say that I stalked her um because I I was trying really hard not to let her know how bad it was but, and it was right when um, Facebook was sort of new-ish. And so um, I would go on and I could see where she she would be. And I'd know that, oh, she's there. I, I would never get in touch with her, but I would know that like, oh, there she is. Um, so I sort of kept tabs with her that way. And then she called frequently and we talked. Um, and we also went out because of field hockey um, she was, she played in the fall. And so we went out to visit her almost every weekend to watch. So everything didn't really get bad until um, the winter, my favorite time of year, not. Now, if someone is facing these same challenges or just depression in general, first of all, it's very brave to talk about depression. It doesn't always, um, it's not the most understood thing in the world. But if someone was facing these same challenges, what would you say to them? What would be the first thing that you might say? Um, to give yourself a break um, and to be compassionate to yourself, um, to, to realize that this is, you're not a bad person and, and people struggle and to try to find somebody who um, can listen to you without judgment and just tell you that you're gonna be okay. And what helped you the most? What helped me the most? Um, yes. My husband, honestly, he was probably um, the biggest help. I don't think he had a lot of fun helping me, um, but um, he was, he never left and he, he stood by me. He at and I write about this in the book. I had we went to a fencing match for my younger daughter, and I completely fell apart. And um and he and I went into a corner and he just like stood there, like a big bear, um, protecting me so that nobody would see um my lovely face. Was it hard to write a book like this? Uh, do you feel vulnerable? releasing a book such as this yeah that's two a good separate question. question yeah no that's a good question or two questions um so uh writing about the depression was hard and i um had been working with an editor and i gave her the pages that i had written and she came back and she said you need to go deeper and i was like i don't like you um but <laughs> she was right and so I did go deeper um, and and it was harder. It, it brought back, and it's interesting, I was telling somebody this, I had to proofread the book recently and I got to that section and I was like, I'm just gonna skim this. Um, and then I went back and looked at it more carefully, but yeah, that was hard. And yes, I do feel vulnerable, but um, it's what I tell my students to write about. So I can't, um, tell them to do something and then not do it myself. Yeah, I'm sure you tell them you have to go there, but it's really hard. I've uh, worked with a lot of people that have written memoirs and they it's just, it's hard to take that leap. Um, I also noticed on, on your webpage, you've said that fiction is not your strength. You started out writing fiction. So, so why is that? Like, why do you feel it's not a strength of yours? Um, I, 
it's a really good question. I wrote, so DeWitt will, um, a long time ago when I was a graduate student at Emerson, which was very long ago, I worked with um, Dick Dupre. Do you remember him, DeWitt? And um, and he, I, I wrote a novel of some sort with him. And, um, and I had fun doing it, but I just don't have, um, it, I don't have to, I, it's hard for me to make stuff up. I like real life. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not easier. I think one of the, the misconceptions about memoir or personal essay or nonfiction work is that it's easy because it's your life that you're writing about. And so you can just be like, oh, I'm sitting in front of a Zoom camera, hoo hoo. Um, but um, writing from your life is real, A, it's really hard and B, you still have to have creativity and present it in a way that is um, gonna bring the reader to you. So it's it's a lot, a lot of my students that, so I, I have a class now where someone wrote in a mid-semester reflection. I didn't want to take this class. I was closed out of poetry and forced into this class. And I was like, okay. And then they said, but this was really good. This is, you know, I didn't realize everything that I was going to learn. And I was like, you know, so I love it. As a question from Lisa Haynes, uh, were there a couple of memoirs in particular that inspired you as you started uh, yours? Very good question. Um, so um, the first memoir I ever read was Growing Up by Russell Baker. And I just was really, um, I just loved it. But the one that had the most influence on me was Abigail Thomas's A Three Dog Life. And um, her writing and that particular story were really influential in my work and figuring out that you could write about dogs and people at the same time and it worked so um I there are a lot of them that I love but um she's she's probably um the most one I also recently read with love from Amy Bloom um that I really liked but when I started this and there's a little tiny book called um, From the Iowa Sea. And that was really influential when I was writing this. This also took a really long time to write. So I've also heard from editors and publishers that when you're writing a memoir, it doesn't have to be 100% true. Like you can embellish certain facts and sometimes you're encouraged to embellish more real facts. Um, would you say that this memoir of yours is 100% true, James? Um, <laughs> I would say that this memoir is 100% true from my perspective. That um, that does not mean that um, you know somebody else who I've mentioned in the book would read it and necessarily agree with me. They'd have their own perspective, but. Um, yeah, I did not, um, I'm not a fan of like making something bigger than it needs to be. So, but it is my perspective. It, it's my memory and that's not the same as everybody else's. So when you wrote your memoir, was there a certain formula that you followed in terms of a time sequence and jumping around or uh, did you just basically just write it without an outline and because i guess the question that's a terrible question tim there's very oh, there there are memoir outlines out there and they're very very common like you know start with a horrific incident then go into your childhood and then work your way up to that incident etc so did you use some sort of guide in that way or not um not really i i mean it 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 evolved and changed over time and initially it was much more dog centric and um maggie going to college was sort of part two and then you know like a lot of other people during the pandemic i brought it out of its drawer where i had hidden it and and i started looking at it and i realized that oh this is really about maggie and so i went back and changed the beginning and then um worked my way back that way but 
yeah, it changed a lot. And I think it's hard to figure out um, where a story starts and where it goes. I jump in time a lot. Well, your cover looks like someone waving goodbye and there's Maggie and a dog. So what was the original, when it wasn't about Maggie at first, did you have another title for her? Oh, yeah. Um, they were bad. Um, uh, I had Puppy Love. Um, that was really a big one. Um, um, oh, I had um, something about, there's a lot of quilting in the book. And so I had something about um, sewing my the seams together or something. I can't even really remember. I had a lot of titles. And I did have Getting Better at Goodbye as a title. And then, oh, and I also had Dogs, Daughters, and Depression. And everyone told me nobody would buy it. Um, so I was like, <laughs> OK. Um, so <laughs> then I came up with um, this one and still had Getting Better at Goodbyes in it. So. That's a very, very good title. I really like the one you settled on, but I think people would buy that other one. If the word dogs was like 24 font and daughters were 18 and depression was two <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what about, um, you're the managing editor for uh, The Bucket, which embraces a web page. You embrace life by embracing um, mortality. So, uh, that's really, really interesting. What do you, uh, what do you do exactly there as managing editor? And uh, you know, what, what do people get out of it when they wander upon that page? So the bucket started about five years ago and it, it's changed, it's morphed a little bit. So it's really about um, uh, avoid what you can do to avoid deathbed regrets and a lot of the art, it's not a like death oriented website. It's really about how to live your life and, you know, how to do things now that are going to make you happy. Um, so we, we, I actually wrote a lot about dogs. Um, I did a lot of the writing, but I also did a lot of the, um, you know, finding ed, finding writers and handing off assignments. And we had like Abigail Thomas came and wrote for us a couple of times and um, articles about um, newfangled ways of uh, put, like instead of putting your body in a um, coffin, there are all sorts of new ways that you can dispose of your dead self. Do you uh, agree with like uh, euthanasia? For Do I upset? personally? Yes. That's the pre. That's the pre coffin question. <laughs> um, I I think. Oh, that's a really tough question. Um, I think that we don't take care of. I mean, because I have animals, I've had to put. I've done euthanasia with my animals. Um. And I and I know I have a a relative who, um, you know, did a um, assisted suicide or whatever you want to call it. So I think there are plate. I think there are times where it's probably a useful thing to have, but I don't know. It's pretty. I mean, I've already told my children to assist me if I ever get that way, and uh, Dave. Yeah. You know, I, I bought some pillows for the occasion, you know, ones that smell kind of nice. I want my last thoughts to be really good smelling. Oh, anyway, we got some uh, questions from Chris Allen. What's the most difficult thing about writing about people who exist in real life? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, to, for me, it was to write with respect um, and to acknowledge that, like, Nobody asked me to write this book. I asked myself to write it. So my daughters are in it. My husband's in it. Some friends are in it. Um, I gave um, everybody, my daughters and my husband in particular, um, the book to read. And they had the ability, they had, I gave them the opportunity that if I said something about them that they didn't want out there, it would be taken out 
um, my relationship with them is more important to me. And, um, but I think that writing about other, you have to try to also look at life through their eyes so that it's not just about me, 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 but like, oh, how did the, how, how is it possible that this person felt when I was doing X? But I think it's, um, it's tricky, but, but ultimately I think you need to have compassion for the other people and respect them. Yeah. And another question from uh, Chris is how many unpublished or half finished books and essays do you have hanging around? It sounds like you have a lot of topics to work with. So how do you decide on the topics for your first book? Um, I have started other books, um, but they didn't materialize into anything. Um, I do have other stuff that I am working on now. Um, and that I hope turn into something full length. Um, and I do write a lot of essays and I don't, it's interesting because um, I, the ideas just come to me through whatever is happening in my life. I just wrote something um, trying to get this out and this whole promotional stuff is a world that I'm not familiar with. And so I wrote a piece um, for Next Tribe on women over 50 who are publishing their debut memoirs. Um, so I just get ideas and go with them. Did you publish sections of the book before seeking a publisher? I, so there was one, I did one essay based on the book um, and I, and it went into an anthology and when I was trying to figure out how to get this book out there, it took me a while, but all of a sudden I went, oh my God, that anthology. And so I went to look to see who published the anthology and they're the ones that ended up publishing this. So I didn't write a whole lot, bef I didn't put a whole lot out there beforehand, but a little bit. All right, uh, DeWitt has a comment and questions. DeWitt Henry says, listening to you, Morgan, it sounds like you're writing about love as nurturing, as parenting, and as animal relationships. And you bring to mind Annie Dillard's Patting the Puppy section of Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Have you read Dillard? And does your love extend to non-animal nature like a transcendentalist? Um, do it. You like, you're up here and I'm down here. Um, I don't think it's a I, yes um, question. <laughs> no, it's... Um, I've read some of Annie Dillard, yes, but I don't know. I can't remember what I've read. And other nature, I, um, yeah, I like, I mean, I like nature. I like, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I loved Hawaii. Um, but I'm not like, um, yeah, I don't know. I like dogs. Um, I'm not giving you a very good answer. Sorry. You're not a cat person at all. <laughs> I was a cat person. And then I married somebody who was not a cat person who took shots and let me keep the cat until it was like, this is not a good scene. So the cat went elsewhere. All right, a little bit before we wrap up on your personal journey. Now, how do you go from a degree in psychology at Vassar to a cum laude uh, degree as a professor of writing and publishing? What was the journey from your first degree to what you're doing now in hundred words or less. <laughs> I always wrote. Um, I it, I took all the classes that were writing oriented. I I did do some other things. I actually wrote an essay that ran in brevity in the brevity blog. Um, that it that I went. I started at Emerson when Dewitt was there, and I went to see a movie called Flashdance and I watched that and I thought I'm going to go do what I want to do I'm going to go be a writer and so here I am and um you know people like DeWitt have helped me um along the way so and then I've met people like Lisa and I don't I love Emerson so I'm very happy there well, I'm very happy that you were the guest tonight and it was wonderful reading. And so people can pick up your book. Uh, 
coming out in three days, and there it is, emptying the nest, getting better at goodbyes with a wonderful cover. And uh, if you know Morgan personally, just shoot her an email. She's got books to send you. So uh, it's all great stuff. Uh, thank you once again uh, for being here. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everybody, for listening to the reading and my attempt at answering questions. We did a great job there. Um, if you are watching this on the Facebook stream, uh, find the link and log in if you want to be part of the open mic. We will let you in for that. And uh, if not, thank you for attending.